Uh, so the name of my talk is called Refactoring Elixir for Maintainability. Now, when I first started out writing Elixir, uh, I was told, write modules uh, and organize your functions into those modules, and then leverage uh, features like pattern matching and guards, um, and use this to write well-structured programs. And coming from JavaScript or Go or uh, Ruby, uh, writing code like this is actually really nice. You have functional code, you have pattern matching, which you don't have in, in most other languages, and this concept of guards. But what wasn't immediately obvious to me was when pattern matching got in the way of good code. When were you pattern matching too much? Um, and it wasn't also clear when I could use certain patterns to remove code duplication. And from reading the Elixir guide, I'd heard of protocols and I'd heard of behaviors, but I didn't really understand when I would want to use them and when they were useful. So for the next 20 minutes, I want to consider when to pattern match, when it makes sense, and when it might not be the right thing. Um, then together, we're going to write some bad Elixir code. We're going to make it better with protocols. Uh, we're going to dive into a little bit about how protocols work under the hood. And then we're going to make our code even better with behaviors. Uh, so a little bit about me. Uh, that's my wife and my little six-pound dog named Pearl. Uh, I'm first and foremost a husband and dog dad, uh, but I'm currently a platform architect at SimpleBet, uh, where we're, we're in the sports betting industry and we're building sort of a sports book as a service using Elixir and Rust. Uh, before that, I spent two and a half years at theoutline.com, uh, and at theoutline.com, I built a, a news website and content management system from the ground up in Elixir, and that's sort of where. Uh, my learnings from the outline are where this talk uh, really comes from. So what drew me into Elixir uh, from the get-go was how cool pattern matching is. So this is an example of how you can use pattern matching to take a binary PNG and pull out the width, the height, and other information from, from the binary. And if I'm imagining how I do this in any other language, this is like hundreds of lines of code. In Elixir, it's just as simple as these 10 lines. Uh, and I found that to be like, fascinating. That's what really drew me into the ecosystem. But as time moved on and I started to write a lot of Elixir, I started to write a lot of code that you see on the top. So I'd try and reach into a data structure, and at every single opportunity that I could pattern match, I would. So here I have a post, and a post has a comment. And the comment has an author, and the author has a favorite pet, and I'd pull it out. Um, and what's really awkward is that I was trying to use pattern matching as a type system. Um, but what maybe I wanted to do was just match on the post, and then you know that a post is well structured. So you can pull data out of it. Um, and that's where I started to write better code that's a little bit cleaner and uh, didn't have the problems of, of the top code. So what I found is maybe don't pattern match to extract nested data structures or to treat it like a, a type system and guard against every possible uh, bad value that could come through. So for example, here's uh, a render post function. Now, a render post function should never take a comment. Uh, that should be obvious from its name. Um, but it's really easy as a beginner to write overly defensive code that tries to accept values that it could never possibly get. So, so don't do that. Avoid that and let it fail in a different way. Don't, don't treat it as... Um, an explicit failure. Let the runtime catch it. But what I learned is do pattern match when it makes sense to um, create an, an API layer that you know matches on a on a struct, um, or when you're handling an API response and you want to pattern match on the result type and then do something specific. Also for parsing PNGs is a really great example of when pattern matching is great and when you're leveraging features that no other language really has. And then maybe it is OK to pattern match when you're uh, pulling out nested data structures. Maybe you're building something that's super high performance, and you found that pattern matching is the best option. Then go for it, but at least you've considered the alternatives. So I mentioned that I spent a lot of time building a news application um, at the outline. And I want to sort of dive into a simplified version of my journey and how I learned to go beyond uh, functions and pattern matching and use some uh, higher level features of the language. <laughs> 
So we're going to do that by building a blog. So this blog is going to use Ecto, and this is the simplest uh, Ecto model that I could think of. You have a title for your post, you have an author, and you have a body, and they're all strings. Now all you need to render that post is this little bit of HTML that stylizes the, the title, the author, etc. cetera. Um, but unfortunately, it's the most boring blog in the world because you have text for the body, but you can't do anything interesting in the body. You can't uh, stylize headers. You can't put paragraphs. You can't have links, images, uh, bold, italics, etc. <clears throat> so we can spice up our blog by uh, using some markdown. So for the uninitiated, Markdown is a very simple markup language that allows you to inline give your text some, some style. And then you use the markdown, you convert it into HTML, and you have something that's a little bit more interesting. So the first step we would take is we would add a function to our view, uh, render markdown. And that render markdown function would just delegate to some markdown module that knows how to convert it from a markdown binary into an HTML binary. And that would just look like this. So CMARC is a library. I believe it uses uh, a C library under the hood. Um, and that takes the string and outputs an HTML string. Um, so we just update our template. We call the render markdown function um, on the post body. And we get our post, but we have a problem. So obviously, you don't want to see the HTML in your post. You want uh, hello to be uh, italicized and world to be bolded, right? Um, so something's going wrong in our pipeline. Now, there's many ways of debugging. You can uh, go the uh, console.log io.puts route, um, or you can open up IEX and call some functions and, and see what the output is. So if we're inspecting here, we're calling phoenix.view.render directly on our view and on our template. And what we see is this interesting data structure. So you can see safe, and uh, safe is followed by what's called an IO list. And this IO list has a series of strings, uh, the first being well-structured HTML. But then if you look closely, you can see all this sort of garbage-looking stuff uh, with ampersands less than, greater than, and that's escaped HTML. So something's going wrong in our pipeline that it's producing escaped HTML when we expected it to just flow through as normal HTML. Now, this is actually part a feature of Phoenix, and this is to prevent user input from injecting bad values into your template. So you can imagine having uh, a comment box on the internet, and someone tries to uh, inject some JavaScript onto your site and steal someone's passwords. Um, and if you look at the type spec, which actually doesn't exist, but I kind of invented myself, you can see that it returns a safe tuple and a list. So what we need to do is we need to modify our render markdown function so that it wraps that markdown that we're injecting, well, sorry, that rendered markdown, it wraps it in the save tuple. And it's really easy to do that. Phoenix gives you a function called raw, which is simply wraps it in the save tuple. And boom, we have a very boring blog, but a boring blog that allows you to stylize text. So we can render markdown, and it works. Um, but the problem is that we now need to remember to call render markdown whenever we want a markdown field. And for a simple example, that doesn't really matter. But you can imagine as we start to add features to this blog, so now we have a title and maybe we want to support stylizing the title as well as a deck. Uh, publish that is maybe a string or a date time, I don't know. Uh, and we add a footer, so we now have four places where we want to call render markdown. And as we add pages, this becomes a little bit complex because maybe there are certain reasons why we wouldn't want to support markdown for certain fields. Now we're here to refactor for maintainability, so let's leverage protocols to solve this problem. So protocols are a way to achieve the <coughs> open close principle in Elixir. Now, the open close principle is part of the solid philosophy, which is actually an object-oriented programming philosophy. Um, but in Elixir, they're a way to achieve polymorphism. And let's explain that by writing some code. And this is actually code from the Elixir guide. 
So this is the size protocol. And the size protocol says, given a data structure that implements the size protocol, um, I can tell you the size of it. And so the definition of the protocol is separate from the implementation for every type. And that's really important because what that means is that some library can define a protocol. And then for any type that you invent, you can implement the protocol and use it wherever the protocol is called. So here we have uh, size implemented for bit string, map, and tuple. And now what happens is at compile time, Elixir is going to take all these definitions. So these def impls are all kind of together right now. But you can imagine they could be scattered all throughout your code base, even in separate libraries. And so at compile time, it does what's called protocol consolidation. And it's going to take all of these and combine them. And what it ends up with is something like this. So all of these functions now become just uh, function head pattern matching, which is really cool. And it's very performant. Phoenix implements a protocol called the safe protocol. And that's uh, what we were looking at before. And the safe protocol uh, is called on every single value that's passed through a Phoenix template. And if we implement that, we can leverage the power of Phoenix and we could do our rendering of Markdown automatically. So the way that we're going to do that is we're going to take that Markdown module that we had before. And rather than it just being a binary that we pass through, we're going to wrap our Markdown in a struct. So the struct is very simple. It's just got text. And it still has our 2HTML function. But inside of it, we're going to implement the safe protocol. And you can think of the safe protocol as very, uh, very much similar to the string.chars protocol, uh, which you're probably familiar when you, whenever you've used to string on any value. Um, Phoenix uses the safe protocol because we're dealing with HTML and it's not quite the same as to string. And all the safe H, all the safe protocol is going to do is delegate out to the to HTML function. Now, before we call our render function on the view. We're just going to wrap our post.body in a markdown struct by calling markdown.new. And now we can remove all instances of render markdown from our template. It's actually just done automatically because all of these values get uh, two, uh, sorry, two IO data from the safe protocol on it. Now that's really cool, and we've removed a lot of duplication, but we could still do better. So, in that example, that expanded example, we had four different fields that required markdown structs. And now we have to wrap all of those fields in a markdown struct. So the way that we can make this a bit cleaner and remove more duplication is by behaviors. So behavior is an interface in an Elixir. And what an interface is, is it's just a common shape uh, it's any module that has uh, certain functions that have uh, the same inputs and same output types. So here for Silicon Valley fans, you have a food behavior. And any module that implements the food behavior must implement the function is hot dog, which takes any term and returns a Boolean. So if we have a hot dog module, it would just return tr uh, true whenever you get past the hot dog. Okay. So we're going to implement uh, the ecto.type, which is a custom type behavior for Markdown. And this is going to simplify our code greatly. So the ecto.type behavior, there's four functions that you need to implement. So the first one is the backing type. So it's the type function. And what you say is, for any given uh, Markdown uh, struct, we want to back it by a string. Uh, so when we store it in the database, we're just going to store a string of um, markdown. Now when we want to pull it out of the database, we want to wrap it in a markdown struct. When we put it uh, into the database, we want to make it back into a string. And the fourth function is cast, which is used for validation and when you're using it with ecto query. Now, before we write the behavior, the way that we're going to use it is that we're just going to replace body with blog.markdown. And that says that whenever we're dealing with body and we're querying the database, we delegate out to the blog.markdown behavior. So this is the implementation. And I omitted 
the functions for the protocol and the 2HTML that we already had. But what you can see here is we have type, which is string, and that's super simple. And we have cast, which takes in a binary and wraps it in a markdown struct. Now, if we had a complete example, maybe we do some sort of validation on it, uh, but we're not going to for this example. Load does the same thing because load is taking from the database and it's converting it into markdown. So you assume that anything that's already in the database is already validated. And then dump is going to take a markdown struct and it's going to marshal it back into the database as a binary. So now you have a post.body, body, which is always a markdown. So here we query the database, we get out the post, we can pattern match on markdown uh, with the very convenient match uh, question mark function, which is actually it's a macro and it's I think my favorite macro, but we no longer need to wrap it. So now we've built uh, a basic blog that has markdown support. Uh, we've simplified our templates by leveraging the phoenix.html.safe protocol. And we've automatically casted markdown fields at the database level using behaviors. So I wrote a blog post about this about a year ago. Um, and this is sort of what this talk is based on. Um, so if you look at my slides, you could find it there. Uh, I also built this presentation entirely in Markdown using this really cool framework called MARP. So I suggest anyone check that out who wants to save time writing presentations. Um, and that's it. I hope you guys learned something today. Yeah, and uh, any questions? Sure. Uh, can you be more specific about uh, from? Experience? Sure. Um, so, do you mean the effects on testing for like the number of tests you had to create, or how it complicates testing? Does it complicate it? Does it make it more simple? Mm -hmm. So, what I've found is that I would say it identifies places where uh, you could have had better testing. So, for example. Uh, we use this exact pattern at the outline because we found that we were having function calls all over the place for the same thing. And in some places where we wanted to support certain features, we had just forgot to wrap it in a simple function call. And this is really easy to miss and test because you, you can write, let's say, a regular expression to validate that some HTML is in the right place. Um, but it's kind of hard to catch all over the place without writing really verbose tests. Um, so I wouldn't say it compli complicated testing as much that it, uh, it just simplified our code base and made it easier to understand and easier to view. Desmond? <laughs> Uh, sure. So, I mean, I guess the, the question would be, can you implement a word counter for for Markdown? Because if you're implementing a uh, if you're implementing a word counter, you probably don't want to do that in its raw form as Markdown, right? Because you have extra ampersands, you have uh, weird markup that would probably make your word counter incorrect. So what you actually might want to do is call a function on the markdown struct, which knows maybe how to convert it to plain text. Or you'd want to have a function which just knows how to count markdown and count words in markdown. So just as a quick follow-up, I, I, what you're saying is I wouldn't want to use that technique if, um, if I just had a basic data structure like a string. If I had something that was markdown that was a little more complicated, then I'm probably not going to directly access that raw representation in other contexts outside of presentation. Exactly, and if you have a higher level presentation or uh, let's say we're dealing with markup here and it, it's not raw text, uh, there might be different rules for how you interact with it because it, 
it's a bit of a opaque data structure, but it is a data structure in some ways. Um, and so you want to delegate to the right domain there. So in our example today, uh, for Markdown, there might be a Markdown specific way for counting words that doesn't make sense when you're just counting, uh, let's say, the text of the Bible or any book in its raw form. Right. Um, I create behaviors, one, when I want to leverage existing. Um, so this is actually a perfect example of when to use behaviors because there's facilities, there's tools that are already um, allowing you to extend them by implementing behaviors. Um, but when I want to create a new behavior in my own code is when I see a pattern. And I see a pattern that's replaced all over the place. And I think that I can interact with... Um, similar entities in exactly the same way. So um, trying to think of an example that's not in the code base I'm working in right now. Um, but if you were dealing with cars, right? So we're, we're, we're a car factory. And every car, or every car um, has very specific ways that it needs to, um, let's say, at the beginning of the manufacturing process, it has specific steps that needs at the beginning, the middle of the end. Well, each car could implement its own behavior. And then the factory would call out to the functions on each car. Um, and those cars are now using specific functions. But that factory only needs to know about the car behavior. It doesn't need to know about individual car implementations. Any other questions? Cool. I think that's it then. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Thank you.